Hey everybody, welcome to Renewal. We are continuing our series in Acts. We're in Acts, uh, Acts of God is what we're calling it, uh, part eight. And I can tell that because I'm writing on my manuscript. You can't see it, but I'm writing the Roman numerals. So just, just appreciate that, that I'm writing the Roman numerals out as I'm typing these. Uh, but we're on part eight, we're, we are continuing in Acts. We'll be in chapter six today. Uh, we have just uh, left off from chapter five, uh, where uh, the uh, apostles went before, uh, were arrested and went before the Jewish leadership again. And uh, we have their conversation that looks a lot like what it has looked like before about uh, either preaching or not preaching uh, in the name of Jesus. The, the uh, religious leadership obviously want them to stop because they are concerned with losing their power and they want to retain their power. And so they don't want to be seen as part of any insurrection or rebellion. And so they want uh, uh, this message just, just sort of go away. That's why they were involved really in the trial and crucifixion of Jesus uh, is because they were trying, uh, they had problems with, yes, the content of his message, but also with what his message would result in. And we're seeing in Acts what the message of Christ results in. We see the coming of the Holy Spirit. We see the promise of the Holy Spirit given and the, and the coming of the Holy Spirit uh, to his followers. And we see what his followers are able to do and, and commanded to do in the power of the Holy Spirit. And now we see at the very end of this, this is how uh, chapter 5 ends, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching that the Christ, that the Messiah, uh, is Jesus, that this Jesus whom they crucified is the one who has come to take away the sin of the world. And he does that through the offering of repentance and forgiveness of sin. And so that becomes uh, still important for Luke's message in Acts. Remember, uh, Luke's gospel is the only gospel with a sequel. Acts is the sequel to that. So we'll, we'll, off and on, we'll talk about a lot of themes and imagery that uh, is concurrent with Luke and Acts. And we'll talk about that again today in our story, as you're going to see. Uh, but we are still uh, chronologically, thematically, structurally in the Jerusalem portion of the ministry that happens in Acts. Uh, really, uh, one through uh, seven, uh, we are focused on the Jerusalem area. Once we get into chapter eight, we're going to focus on uh, Judea and Samaria. And so this chapter six and what happens at the, at the rest of chapter six with the uh, story of Stephen uh, really serves as this transition period to what's going to happen uh, with this message as it uh, geographically spreads out, but also as it uh, ethnically and culturally spreads out to other people, including Gentiles. And so we're going to see in our story, in our passage today, uh, even before Gentiles are a part of uh, this early Christianity, we're going to see even some uh, division that arises between uh, Jewish factions. And so we'll look at that uh, today in chapter 6, leading to the story of Stephen. Next time, uh, just get ready. Uh, if you want to read it ahead of time, that might be helpful, but we're going we're gonna to unpack the story of Stephen in its entirety next time. So uh, if you want to read ahead for that, uh, that might be helpful for you. But let's look at Acts chapter 6, starting in verse 1. Now in these days, when the disciples were increasing in number, a complaint by the Hellenists arose against the Hebrews because of their because their widows were being neglected in the daily distribution. And the twelve summoned the full number of the disciples and said, It is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good repute, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we, uh, but we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word, and what they said pleased the whole gathering. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch. These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. And the word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Let's pray. Father, uh, I pray that as we look at 
uh, this passage, which may be a familiar passage, that you would open our eyes to see it in new ways. God, I pray that you would show us just a vision of your church uh, functioning in unity, responding to division, uh, and God, ultimately pointing us back to you. God, I pray that you would allow us to see uh, your Holy Spirit at work, uh, not just in uh, first century Christians, but in our lives, in our church, in our community today. It's your son's name we pray this thing. Amen. So, we have sort of a, a uh, introduction and a cap on our story uh, today that focuses on the immense growth of the early church. At the beginning, we see that they're growing in numbers, and at the end, we see that they're growing in numbers. But we also see in between those things that they are also growing in uh, wisdom and in the way that they respond to these situations, right? We've sort of seen to up to this point in Acts this sort of idyllic uh, form of the church where everybody shares everything, uh, including possessions. They share uh, their lives with one another. They, they share uh, property. Uh, we, we've seen the story of Ananias and Sapphira again, a uh, story of what it looks like when it's done right uh, with Barnabas and what it looks like when it's done incorrectly, and so we see even the church responding to those uh, uh, difficulties uh, and how even the Holy Spirit responds to those. And so here again we see the leaders, uh, again led by the Holy Spirit, responding to an issue uh, that arises. And the issue that arises arises between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. And so I think what we should do uh, first is sort of a definition of terms, but also uh, a definition of what this is and what it is not. So, uh, what this is, uh, is a, a disagreement between what I believe to be early Jewish Christians. Uh, what it is not is uh, some sort of uh, deep-seated division that exists between two political or ideological factions uh, in the early church. The Hellenists were likely uh, Jews that were uh, in the area that spoke mainly Greek, that possibly were part of the dispersed tribes that were that had moved to the Palestinian area, or uh, were there for a specific festal function, or were there possibly because uh, they had grown old and they were coming to Jerusalem to live out the last of their years, uh, but that spoke mainly Greek. The Hebrews were also Jews, but Jews that likely spoke Aramaic, that were raised possibly more in connection to temple practices, but not necessarily because Hellenists uh, at this time could have been just as involved in temple practices as Hebrews. Uh, but they, uh, the Hebrews likely either spoke Aramaic or some form of uh, Mishnaic Hebrew. Uh, and so there was a language and cultural barrier, but not necessarily, it's not necessarily an ideological one. Some scholars have sought to put an ideological uh, uh, disagreement between Hellenists and Hebrews here, uh, saying that the Hellenists were of a more uh, uh, liberal theology, right, that might include uh, some things that those that held to strict temple practices might disagree with, and the strict temple practices of the conservative ideology would be uh, represented by the Hebrews. Um, that's probably not what's happening here, right, because we see Hellenists right after this. First of all, they choose from the Hellenists, likely their leaders. These are all Greek names that we have, these Hellenistic Jews. They choose uh, the seven, the, the ones that are going to be over this new program of ministry. And directly after this, part of the people that respond to Stephen, part of the people that respond to Paul, part of the people that are responding to other uh, 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 proclaimers and preachers in the early church are Hellenistic Jews that think Paul's message, even Peter's message, is too radical that the gospel would be spread out to the Gentiles. And so well, I, don't see, I don't think we see an ideological uh, uh, rift here between the Hellenists and the Hebrews. What we likely see is a cultural distinction that is resulting in a practical problem. We see later uh, that uh, there will be this 
uh, even ideological distinction between, let's say, Judaizers and Gentile Christians, right? There, there is a definite distinct ideological distinction there uh, uh, between those who would say, yes, uh, the gospel is what you, ex you should accept. Yes, repentance and faith is great, but you should also be practicing all of these Old Testament principles that are connected to the Old Covenant. Uh, and so there's, there, there is a disagreement there that needs to be addressed and that Paul does address. Uh, very clearly, especially in Galatians. Um, but here, I don't think we see that. I don't think we see necessarily a difference between conservative and liberal theology. I think we simply just see there is a problem that arises, and how are we going to deal with that? That's not some distinction between Christians at this point that goes beyond the cultural, possibly even an ethnic distinction here, if we're talking about Jews uh, from other areas that aren't raised, uh, uh, that did not uh, originate in Judea, or if they originated in Judea, they still have a cultural distinction because of their language. And so that's what it isn't. What it is, is this, uh, this problem that needs to be addressed. Uh, we have talked about before the idea of widows in an Old Testament context, but also in a first century New Testament context, being pretty dependent on their communities. And the reason for that was, if you're raised, if you're a woman raised in your father's house, once you're married, you become your husband's responsibility. And if your husband uh, dies, then that responsibility is supposed to, if it's some type of Leverite marriage, if it's some type of familial connection, is supposed to pass to either your family or your husband's family. Uh, one of the, the things that might be going on here is if there are Hellenistic Jews that are in the area that have moved to the area or not from the area, all of those familial connections might not be as apparent as they are for the Hebrews, for uh, those, the, this other uh, sect of Jewish Christians. And so that might be something that requires special attention on behalf of these Hellenistic Jews. Uh, even if it wasn't the Hellenistic Jews uh, that, were, that were raising the concern, there is a special consideration given in Scripture for widows for this purpose because they are at the mercy of their communities. They have to be provided for. And so that brings us to this term, uh, daily distribution. Daily distribution can apply to a lot of things. It can apply to property. It can apply to monetary things. Um, likely here, daily distribution, because of the rest of the context and, be, and because of how we begin, is, is simply talking about food, simply talking about uh, basic needs uh, that arise within this community. And we get probably some of our context from this first verse. When the disciples were increasing in number, this is when the complaint arose. This is when... Uh, the, the grumbling arose is uh, how it can be translated, and we'll talk about that word later. But the complaint arises when, when this explosion of new converts happens, and there, there becomes this situation that they need to respond to that was not something that they needed to respond to before. And, and so uh, we see the apostles, the, the leadership of the early church, responding immediately. We see a need mentioned and a response immediately to what happens. And so uh, to me, I see the fact that, that in the early church especially, we have this focus on uh, responding quickly to crises and responding intentionally. We see that with uh, the result of this complaint and that, that grumbling, right? That grumbling is connected to other places in scripture. The uh, Israelites grumble uh, in the wilderness and God gives them quail, right? We see uh, to a lesser extent other places in scripture where uh, Pharisees and others are grumbling, specifically connected to meal-type imagery when Jesus eats with uh, tax collectors and sinners. They grumble against that. So this, this is different from that, but it's still connected to that meal-type Im imagery, which is very important to Luke. I think that's, that's, that's part of what's going on here is there is this idea of table fellowship that comes up later in uh, the book of Acts where... Uh, Peter has some problems uh, that need to be corrected in Acts chapter 10 uh, when he is told don't call what uh, the Lord has made clean, unclean, talking about specifically food and dietary laws, but also possibly connecting to the eating uh, and fellowship that's going to happen as a part of bringing the gospel to Gentiles, which Peter himself has problems with. Paul later has to say in Galatians, I opposed Cephas, I opposed Peter to his face uh, because when he came to Antioch, uh, uh, he was eating with Gentiles, and then uh, some people from James, or perhaps James also, uh, uh, 
got in his grill about it and told him to stop doing it, and he stopped doing it, right? And so the, Peter has to be corrected again in terms of table fellowship and in terms of uh, divisions within the early church. Now, that's, that becomes more pronounced. I think this is a, uh, maybe a foreshadowing or a precursor. It's not the same event. It's not the same uh, thing that's going on, but it is. It has the opportunity to cause that division, but because of the apostles' direct and immediate response it does not do that. And I think for Luke's theology con to connect this to the imagery of eating and fellowship and who gets food, it, I think we are connecting it to all those big picture things that Luke loves from Isaiah, this heavenly banquet where people and divisions and, and all the things that the world would say would divide us disappear because the Lord is the one who, who brings us together in that. And I think uh, sometimes that can be uh, a, f a way of us pointing to that heavenly reality without making things change here, without, without pursuing uh, that, that reality here, uh, for us to point to that heaven rea heavenly reality and say someday that's going to be great, I think empties this text of its meaning because this text right here does that already. It, it begins to breathe that reality into, his ex into its existence. Th this is where we get... This is why I think the response of the apostles is so important, because when they, when they see the need, when they, when they have the need brought before them, when they hear that there is someone who is going without or there is someone that is suffering, their response is not to explain to them why they're not suffering. Their response is not to say to them, well, everybody needs to eat. Their response is simply to feed them. It's to make it possible for their need to be met, is to even put that need of what is likely a minority in the early church above the need of the majority, is likely part of their response in choosing Greek leadership, Hellenistic leadership, for this problem to show them not only are we responding, not only is this something that we take seriously, but we are we're choosing leaders from among you to make that a part of the response. The complaint here is not the grumbling that we hear of the Old Testament. The complaint is simply saying that there is a need and there needs to be a response. It's the same gracious response we get in the Old Testament when it is grumbling, right? When it is something uh, that we can see as ridiculous, right? God saves the, the Israelites from slavery and they're brought into the wilderness and they're given manna from heaven and they're like, mm, that's fine, but what else do you have? And so uh, instead of just saying, okay, that's the end of it right now, quail, meat is given. They, they get the... the, the, the uh, response that they are looking for even in the midst of their uh, possibly selfish grumbling. This is not selfish grumbling. This is simply pointing out the fact that an inequity exists. An inequity exists that needs to be righted. And it's connected to this idea of fellowship. And so uh, we see from the apostles uh, what seems like uh, what can be read as uh, uh, not giving this the full importance, but I don't think that's what's happening here. So the 12 summon the, the full number of disciples, and they say it's not right for us to give up uh, preaching the word of God to serve tables. And what they're saying is, that what they're not saying is, nobody has time for this, and so it's not important. What they are saying is, there is uh, a mission that we have been given, but very wisely they, they uh, discern the need for more leadership, more roles, more positions. And so some people see the beginning of deacons here. Some people see the beginning of a church office. I don't think it's that pronounced. That, that word for service, for ministry, uh, is the same word we get, uh, we get deacons from. I don't think it's that pronounced as it is here. It, it looks a lot like when they pray and they lay hands on them what's going to be connected to the office of deacon later. And the qualifications they mention look a lot like the qualifications for deacons. So I think this is a precursor to that, to all of those, those church offices that we're going to have. 
Uh, but it's not as pronounced here, right? Because it's not just this strict division of labor. We're going to go preach the gospel, and you are going to go do all the practical things, and you do all the practical things, and we'll preach the gospel, and never the twain shall meet, right? That's not what's being said here, right? They are saying that there's a, there's a definite need for us, for the witnesses to this Jesus, uh, the actual physical witnesses, because they're all made witnesses, but the actual physical witnesses of his presence to go and proclaim boldly what's happening. And so this is something that you're able to hand or, handle and we give you, as part of the laying on of hands, is we're giving you the authority, the Hellenists, we're giving you the authority to go and do that. We're giving you the power to go and do that. And so we see something that's very different from the world around them. Something that would be very different from a Roman response to the poor and needy. Usually when Roman sources talk about the poor and needy, it is connected to uh, uh, criminalization or connected to uh, some inherent sense of dishonesty or treachery that has led them to this place. It's very different from what was even an Old Testament Jewish concept of our ability and our uh, requirement to give charity to those who are in need without getting anything in return and without the expectation of getting anything in return. But even from that Jewish mindset, even from that Jewish Old Testament concept, there arose this Jewish teaching, even in the first century, among Jews, where you would see someone in need or you'd see someone uh, that was destitute, and there, there arose this Jewish teaching even. Don't do anything in that situation because possibly that person is under God's punishment, and so you don't want to get in the way of God's punishment, so you don't do anything. It's, here it is, it's so different from both of those. It's an immediate response, and it, and, and it solves the problem. It's not just some amb, ambiguous thing where I hope in heaven one day this diversity will be ended and all of this unity we will be able to experience. No, that's not what they do. They, they practically respond to the situation. They say, okay, how do we get these people food? How do we feed them? What does it look like for us to, to put a system in place that does that continuously that we are intentional about? What does that look like? And they ask that question themselves and they answer it and then they do it. Very different from their context, possibly very different from our own context. A, a, a blaming or a subjugation of those who are already oppressed or even a, a, a fickle explaining our way out of responsibility or action is not what happens here. The complaint is heard, the complaint is responded to, and the people that they set up in these leadership positions, right, don't just do that thing. They, we, we, we talked about the, the qualities that these men that they choose from among them have. Therefore, brothers, uh, which includes brothers and sisters, by the way, brothers pick out from among you Seven men of good repute, full of wisdom, uh, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. And so, I think it's interesting that the people they chose had to be of good repute, not just among the believers, but of good repute among the world. People who would be, like we were going to see later in, in reference to offices of the church, people who would be considered above reproach, and people who would have this wisdom, this discernment, this ability to see and to seek out what the righteous thing to do is. And so this is not just you go feed the widows and we're going to go preach the gospel, because right after this, uh, we stop in verse 7. In verse 8, Stephen, one of the leaders, that is, that is uh, meant to serve tables here, is preaching the gospel. And so uh, I don't think a proper response is for us to say, Stephen, stay in your lane, uh, right? You're supposed to be serving tables. What are you doing preaching? That's, that's not what this is. This, this is the beginning. This is the, this is the start of their ministry. This is the church being the church. Not to separate, well, I can never be a part of this or you can never be a part of this, but to say that we are devoted to the to the to the teaching and the proclamation of Christ, and the church, therefore, is devoted to our teaching and proclamation because it comes directly from Jesus. This comes directly from Christ, too, to not neglect the widows and orphans, to not neglect those who are in need. This, this is part of that ministry, and they are all tangled up. 
There's not this di di division of labor. There is a division of roles, and that, that's going to be more pronounced later, but there's not a division of labor. We don't see Paul uh, saying, I can't be a part of tent making. We don't see Peter, uh, we do see Peter struggle with what it looks like to, to be involved in table fellowship, but then we see him directly involved in it. Uh, so there's not this division even between what we're talking about for uh, the seven, right? That the, they're chosen for this table fellowship, this ministry of tables that turns into preaching, right? After this, when we get to Acts, when we get to later in Acts chapter 8 and 9, we see Philip preaching, right? We, we, we see uh, that there is this 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 introduction to the program of Christ for these new believers, these people who have uh, proven themselves uh, to be controlled by the Spirit, to be of sound mind, to be able to make the right decisions, uh, that are given more responsibility and authority and power, instead of just saying, forget about it. Well, that'll work itself out. Let's look for ways for that to happen and be the church serving helping, using their power in order to give it away. What's happening here is that divisions aren't ignored or reinforced. They're talked about. They're answered. There is a response. There is this way of responding that doesn't stop with words or even putting yourself in a certain place. It leads to substantive action. And it makes me think of this uh, C.S. Lewis quotation that I've seen a lot over uh, uh, social media recently. Uh, and, it, and it's talking about the division that we can sometimes see. Uh, here it is. If they are wrong, they need your prayers all the more. And if they are your enemies, then you are under orders to pray for them. He's talking about the church. He's talking about specifically divisions within the body of Christ. And that comes from the first chapter of Mere Christianity, when he talks about Christianity as... He's not saying... He's explaining the fact that he doesn't mean mere Christianity as a substitute for all of the confessions of faith that exist, but as a unifying concept, and he thinks about it like a great hall. Mere Christianity, to C.S. Lewis, is the hall of things that we agree about. And there are rooms off of this hall, and you can call those churches or denominations or whatever. And how he explains it is in each of those rooms, we're not meant to stay just in the hall. To be identified as Christian in name only and, and, and to not decide how uh, that philosophy leads to a praxis. That philosophy, that idea, the, those, those things that ruminate within us should lead us to a practice within one of those rooms is what C.S. Lewis is saying. And, and he says in those rooms is where the chairs and the food and the fellowship and the warmth of the fire are found. And once you're in one of those rooms, you don't use it as an excuse to throw rocks at people in the other rooms. <laughs> you don't use it as an excuse to reinforce the divisions between you and the people in the other rooms. And this is where that quotation comes from. If they're wrong, they need your prayers all the more. If they're your enemies, then you are under orders to pray for them. That is one of the rules, and he's talking about the entirety of, of, of Christendom. That is one of the rules common to the whole house. Not just to disperse with divisions with our words, but to demolish it with our actions. It's not enough just to be in the presence of others. It's not enough uh, just to not say the wrong thing. We have to say and do the right thing. It takes the work behind our words to make any type of reconciliation happen because anything less uh, I would say is pretense uh, and, and borders on the outright phoniness to be able to say something without backing it up with action 
to be able to see a, a problem in the early church. Think about if the response to widows not being fed was, of course, everyone's able to eat. Think about if the response was, well, what did, what did you do to avoid the mealtime? How is this your fault? That wasn't the response. See, the philosophy of Christianity, the ideas connected to the message of Christ were not what the complaint arose from. It was the practice, or lack thereof, of those Christian beliefs that led to the complaint. And it likely, I mean, it's probably, it's not malice on, on the apostles' part that led to this discrepancy in who gets fed and who doesn't. It's likely a result of this expansion of growth and new problems arising and responding to those problems. But it wasn't ignored. And it wasn't, it wasn't something... Even in this statement, it's not right for us to, to give up the preaching of the gospel to go and focus on this. That's not a washing their hands of the matter. They still, they, they provide a way for it to happen. That's not them saying this isn't important enough. They say this is important for us to deal with, and so that's why we've, we've constructed this leadership to deal with it. We chose men who had a good report of themselves in the community but not just that, that we're able to make wise choices, like what your parents say when you leave the house. Make good choices. And you're like, maybe, maybe I will, maybe I won't. But it has to do with this idea that even the, the apostles and disciples were told uh, themselves that they would be the judges over Israel, that they would be the ones in charge of what happens on earth that's connected to Christianity and now they're using that judgment to pick people who can do right things when things get difficult. Who can literally right wrongs. So we're doing a movie night tonight uh, with the students. And we're watching. I can tell you this because it's not a spoiler because it will already have happened by the time you see this. But we're watching Scoob, which is the new Scooby-Doo movie. <laughs> which, <laughs> which I had to watch just to make sure it was okay for us. I mean, I'm sure it's fine. But I watched it the other day just because I don't want to, like, show some of the students that I haven't seen before. And so it brought back all of these rush of memories of all these Hanna-Barbera cartoons, right? Quick Draw McGraw and Huckleberry Hound and uh, uh, who's, what's the, uh, is it Snaggletooth? Snagglepuss? What's his name? Snaggle Puss, where the guy who says, um, exit, stage left. <laughs> but, but so just focus. I'm not going to start talking about Hannah Barbera cartoons uh, entirely. But it made me think of one specific one, which is not a well-known one, and his name is Touche Turtle. Do you know who Touche Turtle is? Touche Turtle. He had, he, he, he had like a, a hat, like the Three Musketeers, and a sword that was always bent. But Touche Turtle, yeah, it's weird. Touche Turtle, he had, a, he had the side, he had, he had a big dog sidekick whose name was Dum Dum. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> That's not the point of the thing. The point of the thing is Touche Turtle had a philosophy. Touche Turtle would sit around and bemoan the fact that he didn't have a good deed to do. The, there was this sight gag to where he would, the, 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 like his shell would start shaking and it would be like a, a telephone ringing and he'd just go into his shell and, he'd, and the camera would change and he'd be in there on the phone because someone would be calling him for help. And he would be so happy just to be able to help somebody. He'd be walking down the street and snatch a mouse from a cat at, just to help, right? Just to, just to do something. I had this book when I was a kid. It was Touche Turtle. Uh, but at the end of it, my grandmother used to read to me, at the end of it, Touche Turtle's phrase becomes, what was wrong, I made right. And constantly he's looking for things to make right. I think that's part of our, what our goal 
as the church should be. Yes, to, to preach and proclaim truth, but to actually right wrongs, especially within our body, especially within the church, that we would see someone in need and be able to respond to it, that, that we would be able to, to be the hands and feet of Christ and not just a uh, clanging symbol but that we would be able to see that we are chosen people, chosen not merely to wait on tables, but chosen as an intermediary between a fallen world and a Savior that loves them. And so we see at the very end of this, in verse 7, the transition to what Stephen is going to be preaching. The word of God continued to increase, and the number of disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests became obedient to the faith. And so there, there are obviously systems of leadership connected to the temple, probably thousands of priests and lesser priests in Jerusalem, that even those that should be diametrically opposed to this message begin to receive it because they see the witness of the church, see the witness of how the church treats itself and how it treats outsiders. And so we see the word of God, and that, uh, specifically the words that are being preached and the message of the gospel is multiplying, is extending, is taking root in those who hear it because of the integrity of those who preach it. And so let that be said of us. Let, let us do everything that we can this very week, this day, to let it be said of us that the Christ, the Holy Spirit that lives in me, that, that's at work in my members, brings about justice and righteousness and a way for people to have this, this repentance and faith that I now have because of my action in the world. Thanks for watching. Uh, remember, we will uh, have our Zoom call at 8, so uh, look at the group me for stuff uh, on that. We also, uh, we had a, an in-person event uh, this, this past Sunday. A bunch of people came, we played uh, outdoor games, we socially distanced, it was, it was a great time to see everyone, but we're gonna continue to do things like that, so stay tuned to the group me and social media because we just made a whole schedule for the rest uh, of June and part of July for cool things that we're gonna do uh, together. I believe the next thing is glow in the dark soccer at the soccer fields. Soccer, ultimate, anything you want to do uh, that we have things that glow. But uh, stuff like that uh, is being planned, but also uh, there are gonna be some very intentional ways that we can uh, reach out into the community and serve. And so uh, we want you to be a part of all those things. We want you to be a part of the fellowship, but we also want you to be a part of uh, what God is doing uh, in our local community and what he can do through us uh, outside of this place. So come be a part of it with us and uh, stay tuned for uh, all of those future announcements and we'll see you on the Zoom call. Thanks.